welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace, reporting from this year's 2016 Blue Note Jazz Festival here in New York City. One of the artists that was highlighted at this year's festival is guitarist Fabrizio Sodi. As you might know, six years ago I profiled this gentleman and this year he put out a brand new recording entitled 40. Now, this album features a dynamic trio and he's really going and diving into one his composition skills, as well as he's really paying homage to the great, great guitars ranging from Wes Montgomery to Jim Hall. I had a chance to sit down and break bread with Fabrizio and we talked about this brand new CD, the importance of the trio setting, and also talked about some of his influences. And as you might know, this gentleman has been producing some very important acts for well over the last 25 years, ranging from Cassandra Wilson to the great rap group Dead Prez, just to name it in this feud. So sit back, relax, and enjoy highlights of Fabrizio's official New York record release performance of 40 here on the Pace Report as part of this year's 2016 Blue Note Jazz Festival here in New York City. this year's 2016 Blue Note Jazz Festival and I just want to congratulate you on this brand new CD this trio record and I, I, I listened to this record and it's very warm it's very personal and I noticed that it seems like you're having a lot of fun with this trio yeah I mean this new trio you know with Peter Slavov and Francisco Mel I think um, you know I picked those musicians for several reasons one, they're my contemporaries, you know, they're around my age group. So, and second of all, they also are like, come from different ethnicity, you know. I was born in Italy, uh, Peter was born in Slovakia, you know, and uh, actually Bulgaria, and uh, Francisco is from Cuba. So, that proves the, the great quality about jazz, where like, you know, you have individuals, who, you know, they come from different countries and different cultures, but then we all learn like this the tradition of jazz and then we all give it our own twist. And I think that this trio it's really interesting. We can clearly play in the tradition but then we put our own touch to it and uh, I'm very very happy. And, and again this is the very beginning of this trio but I plan on playing for hopefully the next 30 years with this trio and, and develop it. Francesco Mela has been a very important figure in the jazz scene for the last 15 years. He's play, playing with McCoy Tyner and some other luminaries, Joe, Joe Lovano. Mm -hmm. And it seems like he can really adapt 
to any kind of music setting because I know in Joe Lovano he has two drummers yeah. and McCoy he's with the trio and with yeah. you it seems like there's a friendship and a connection there I mean I think Francisco is really versatile and again I love the fact that he knows the traditional jazz and the form but then he has this wild side this uh, Latin Cuban thing going on which I think you know makes the music much better and that's what I was looking for for this particular project you do Joe Beam's How Insensitive, one of my favorite compositions by him. And a lot of these new songs are the world is getting ready to hear your, your, your compositions. How do you feel as a composer right now, as a musician, moving forward with this trio? I mean, again, I, I titled this, uh, this album 40 because I turned 40 last year. And I, I, thought, I think it was really, it is actually a milestone in my life. I mean, as a human being, because I reached to 40, and it, that's the goal already. And, and then, really to start a new phase, because, you know, I really feel now, and you can hear in this album, I did all these original compositions, very personal, like you said, I'm really talking about my life, my, own, my life experience. And my playing, um, you know, I really feel that finally, I have nothing to prove to anyone. Uh, besides myself, you know, to keep improving and reach deeper and get better. But I really play with the, maybe with the freedom that, that I never had before to really be myself. You know, playing in a trio, you know, you think of great piano trios and guitar trios you don't see too much or not hear too much of. I think the only one that I can think of the, the, the most is probably mm, Joe Pass. He did trio, and yeah. then Wes Montgomery did trio. It, 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 trio, but you know, Wes was really big on his organ trio right. more, more than with the upright bass. But I mean, there are a lot of. Um, there's been a lot of guitar trios through the history, but I picked a certain way of writing and a certain way of playing in this album where, like, it can be very austic sometimes. You know, like the the guitar trio, it's it's a difficult instrumentation for someone that is not really into jazz or into guitar but I picked this composition and wrote and played in a certain way to try to make it you know a little more accessible to even people that you know to, to basically try to cover for missing the, the harmony going on so I'm really trying to play every change chord change you know really be really start from the melody and then playing a line around the melody and develop the melody just to going into just uh, blowing over changes. <laughs> This is the 
former studio of David Bowie. And I want you to explain the role of a record producer because you have produced and played on some very important records from Cassandra Wilson to Mariah Carey. I just want to understand how the vision goes into one, securing the talent and then also securing their vision to make sure that something is relevant and can be played for 30, 40, 50 years. So I think that um, I work in two different way as a record producer. There is one is the traditional, like let's say, for example, you mentioned my work with Cassandra Wilson. That would be more a traditional one, meaning picking the right material, picking the concept of the album, then picking the right recording studio, picking the right musicians. And then of course, most of the time, because I'm a musician, I also play. Um, and that is one way of producing a record in a traditional way, let's say, you know, like it used to be. Like some record producers, they were not even musicians. They were just people with a great ear and great knowledge about music, but not necessarily musicians. But then m m all my work in pop, hip hop, R&B, there is a completely different role because there, sometimes I write from scratch, you know, just guitar and voice, and then I develop a track. But most of the times I just give musical track that are already prepared and they're almost final. And then I give them to a singer or a songwriter or, or a rapper and they write on top of it. And then of course I make sure that the, the mix is right and we can talk about the concept. But they're two very different ways of producing and I, I've done in these 25 years of career, I've done both. You know, you've straddled the musical lines, hip hop, and you've done jazz and R&B and pop. Are there certain nuances or certain things that you have to go into going into a musical genre, say hip-hop, because you've done some prolific stuff in hip-hop as well. Yeah, I mean, I have the chance to work, you know, with the press, uh, Ghostface, Tupac, uh, Q-Tip, uh, a lot of cats, man. And um, I don't discriminate. Listen, man, um, I grew up as a jazz musician. You know, I studied jazz since I was a little kid, and that's my passion. That's what, what I love. That's my way of expressing me as an artist, Fabrizio Sodi, the artist, is a jazz musician that then explores also in other genres of music. But then all this other stuff for me is just good music and bad music. So I don't discriminate. You can play me an EDM track or a pop song, anything. Music is just good and bad. So I try to do the best music that I can do. <laughs> and that's my mission in life. What do you tell young musicians in inspiring producers who want to get into this because you've been in this for a minute what are some things that you would tell them coming in ground running as a producer I mean I would say this um, you know I realized that you know when I came here because it was coming from another country it was coming from Italy where like it didn't exist like a former education you know about music being a musician and the music business. The music business is really important because you can be a great musician and then you come to New York and you're really struggling to find a way to make something happen. And for me, unfortunately, I didn't have, I didn't study music business or stuff like that. So I had to figure out everything on my own. And you know, it, it has not been easy, man. <laughs> you know, today I'm where I am in my life and in my career, but you know, I definitely struggle from zero to where I got now in life. I mean, I went through every phase, I mean, like without, it, really without any doubt. And um, so what I would say to a young musician is that to study his craft, you know, his artistry, whatever, either he picks to be a producer or an instrumentalist, whatever he wants to be, but also to understand how the business works so he can make the right decisions and he can, you know, find the most effective way to reach a goal in his life and being able to sustain himself or herself with music, which, Unfortunately, in most cases, even great musicians sometimes, they really are struggling to support themselves. And that it's really something that, that, I, that I hate, especially in jazz. It's, it's crazy how many like, incredible musicians you know, that are struggling so much. And sometimes you, know, you, have to, you, know, you have to really be smart. And you know, even myself, I, I said at one point when I came here as a young kid, I said, okay, mu this jazz is my passion and that's what I do and everything, but then I also was fortunate to be able to make some great songs, have success with that, which they, they gave me the, the chance to even develop my jazz life and my jazz career in a much less stressed way, because I didn't have to, at one point, at the beginning I used to play five gigs a day. 
Then after 10 years that, this, that I was here, around 24, 25, I started to have some success. And you know, I was able to just pick the gigs, pick who I wanted to play, and just do the right thing f for me, for my growth as an artist, for my career, and then also you know, to, to sustain yourself. But when you have something else you know, that is still music, so you're still making music, that helps you to do that better, I think is great. <laughs> Because from what I understand when we talked earlier, you came to America for a little time before you went back to serve in Italy for the armed services. But when you came here, you knew that if you're going to be serious, you have to play this music. So listen, I have, you know, one thing that I consider myself really lucky, that I was born knowing exactly what I was going to do in my life. I mean, if you ask me when I was six years old, what are you going to be? I'm going to be a musician. I didn't have any doubt. And people thought I was crazy. Especially because, again, in Italy, there isn't a formal school that you can go to. So I started to basically play piano. My grandmother used to play piano, and she told me how to read music, and she told me some, you know, Bach, Beethoven, Chopin. So I started with that. And then at nine years old, I switched to guitar. And I started to check out from a record collection all this West Montgomery stuff, Duke Ellington, Miles, John Coltrane, and that's it. And I fell in love with this, with this type of music. And I was really young, but it just it really spoke to me. You know, it was, I fell in love with it. So at that point, I, not, I stopped with classical music and started to study that, but I really was studying from the records. Then when I was 12 or 13, I had some private you know, teachers. Um, I would buy the, all the books they were using the Berklee School of Music in the United States. They were imported in Italy, so I would, you know, read all this stuff, you know. Uh, the Joe, Joe Pass wrote some books, I studied that. And then when I came here, you know, I started to play with musicians like uh, Victor Jones, Steve Laspina, Randy Brecker, all these great musicians where they accepted me. And, and with them, I improved so much. You know, I really started to understand what it is to be a real professional musician, a professional jazz musician. All the tunes you need to know, all the, you need to be versatile, quick to read, quick to adapt to situations. And that was my school, my real school. I never went to, I never had, the, I, I wished I had the chance to go to a Berkeley School of Music, to NYU, to whatever school that gives you, because that makes things so much easier for you. But I had to learn in my own way. <laughs> So you're saying that life basically was 
life in the band stage has pretty much been your teacher. It's been my teacher, you know, then, you know, I love to study still today. I practice on developing new concepts, you know, I wouldn't, the day that I stop feeling the need to study more, to, to get better, is the day that I'm finished, probably. So I hope that day never comes. I hope it just comes when I leave this body, <laughs> you know. So, but other than that, I think that there is nothing like the experience of being on stage and playing with different musicians, different situations. That's the, that's the real school. Has getting married and having a child, has it changed you a little bit? Yeah, that has changed, I mean, you know, completely my life, I would say. Um, in a in a better way, I think I waited, um, you know, long enough, you know, until I find the right person to to create a family with, and um, and it's great, man. I mean, it just it, it's it's a source of you know responsibility, but on the other end, incredible inspiration, and uh, a lot of the music from this album was inspired by these two or three years of my life that you know have been substantially different from my life before. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace, reporting from this year's 2016 Blue Note Jazz Festival. I'd like to personally congratulate Fabrizio Soti for his brand new CD40. Make sure you guys go out and support it and buy it. It's available on iTunes as well as Amazon.com. I'd like to personally thank the organizers of this year's 2016 Blue Note Jazz Festival as well as the staff and management at the Highline Ballroom for their warm hospitality. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column, as well as my past segments. Till next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace.